Greetings, citizens of Planet X! Welcome to another OS Nerd video! In this video, Next Step 2.2. Again, I'm not sure exactly when this system was released. Next Step 2.1 was released in March of 1991, and Next Step 3.0 was released in September of 1992. So, Next Step 2.2 falls somewhere in between those two dates. Now, this is a different emulated machine than my previous videos. This is a Nextcube Turbo, which is a 33 megahertz Motorola 68040 with 128 megabytes of RAM. It's also emulating a Next Dimension add-on board, which is a 32-bit color accelerator unit. It provides a 33 megahertz Intel 860 RISC CPU with 64 megabytes of memory and it allows me to demonstrate two features of Next Step that were added in the 2.0 release and that is color and multiple monitors. So let's log in and have a look. So as we can see the first thing we notice when we log on is the wonderful color of the one icon. Uh, to be fair, uh, by the time Next Step 3.0 was around, they added a lot more colour to the interface. Um, this, I think, was only partially colour because the Next Dimension add-on card was required, and that cost a little bit extra. Well, a lot extra, in fact. And most users of the workstation had the system display, so the dock and uh, the file viewer, on the primary display which happened to be the grayscale 17 inch or what have you next monitor running the 19 inch color megapixel display as a second monitor now I don't have the screen real estate to be able to run both simulated monitors side by side so I'm only capturing the uh, 19 inch megapixel color display here hence why there's only one icon in color because although you can run the primary display on the color display most people probably didn't in fact some versions of Next Step had some interesting behavior if you did so um, but they will do for the purposes of this demo. Okay, so the second thing we might notice is the fact that the file viewer is exceptionally different. It's much better looking in the 2.0 releases. In fact, this is its final form right way up until open step 4.2. Um, the various components are the shelf, the uh, icon view, and the main browser view. So the shelf view basically acts as a kind of dock thing that you can use to place icons temporarily. So, for example, we have here this README file, and if I wanted to keep it for posterity, I could drag it onto the shelf, and no matter where I am in the file system, a single click would take me back to that file, and a double click would launch it if it happened to be an application or a file that an application could handle. If it was a directory, then nothing much would happen if I double clicked it. Now, any removable media such as CD-ROMs or floppy disks, when mounted by the underlying system, would also be made available in the shelf here, and you could single click on it to navigate to that, uh, that removable media. If you wanted to unmount it, you could either go to the disk and then go uh, disk eject, or you could drag it from the shelf or from here onto the recycler, and boom, it's dismounted. Now the shelf itself only allows for one row of icons and its width is determined by the width of the window. However, if you go into Info, Preferences and then Shelf, you can select the Resizable Shelf option which will put this, um, this dimple into place and then you could drag the dimple down or up to get rid of the shelf or to make the shelf deeper. You can only ever have two rows of icons on the shelf unfortunately, but two rows is usually enough. Now normally the way I do things is I have my home directory here, I have next apps here, I also have local apps, and you can drag files in between. So for example if I go into library here, documentation, Motorola, if I wanted a copy of the digital signal processor assembly manual, I could drag that into my home directory and I have a copy of it. You could also, by doing various key combinations, move a file or you could create a symbolic link to the file as well. 
to remove things from the shelf, you simply drag them off and they are gone. Now, the icon view here gives you a graphical representation of where you are in the file system. It might not make any sense given that you have a similar representation with column view here, um, but if I go into icon view, then now it makes sense. So if I click back on the root directory and then go into next apps, I can see I'm in next apps. If I go back in here into next library and then into fonts, you can see that I'm in the fonts directory and so forth. You could also use these as drop targets. So for example, I can, for some reason, I don't think I've set up the permissions properly on this box, I could create a symbolic link to this font in the root directory, which I'm not going to do because that would be remarkably stupid and pointless. So the usual views apply, you have icon view, you have browser view, and you have listing view. I prefer browser view personally. You can have as many browsers as you want open, you can drag and drop between all of them, etc. So that's the file viewer, that's probably the largest change and this is the one that sticks right the way through to the end of life of OpenStep, OpenStep 4.2. Let's have a look at some of the applications to see how those have changed in the 2.0 and 2.2 releases. So preferences has changed a little bit. Uh, they got rid of that stupid button that I didn't like and they replaced it with radio buttons which make a lot more sense. Under the keyboard view, because Next started selling internationally, you have more than one keyboard option. You can select a British English keyboard or a Swedish keyboard or a Swiss French keyboard and you have access to the keyboard panel that shows you how the keys are all laid out on that particular keyboard. The display preferences are pretty much the same in that you have the brightness, the volume and the automatic dimming of the display to save the phosphor. General preferences are slightly changed. Now you can set the, the, the language of the system as well as the fonts that's used by the application and the default beep. Previously this preferences pane had things like the position of the menu which has now been moved out to its own preference pane. So the clock pane looks pretty much the same, there isn't really that much change going on there. The power pane has a few changes. You also had this option for power, which lets you turn the machine on at certain times of the day or what have you. Um, I assume this is so that if you had a task that needed to be run at midnight because there was nobody else online and you needed the compute power of, I don't know, three or four Renderman nodes, this would let you turn the machine on at midnight and it would automatically start a job from the dock and, and boom, that's that out the way. The password preferences pane is pretty much the same, but we have this new pane here now which lets you set the position of the menu. It also has an option that allows you to set custom keyboard shortcuts for various commands. Next we have this monitor preferences pane which lets you set up multiple monitors on the machine. Next Step 2.0 was the first version of Next Step that supported multiple monitors. So here I am using the Next Dimension display which is this one here and the megapixel display which is the system display is currently off I am using the next dimension as master and here we have the Unix preference pane the only option here that is new really is the large file system this basically um, enables some optimizations within workspace manager so if you are browsing a file system with lots of files in one directory it won't take forever to draw the contents inside file viewer so that's pretty much it for the preferences panel. Next we have the email application. There are some slight changes here. Let me just delete some of my testing so I can show you what they are. So if I click on send, there have been some slight changes in the button. For example, now we have the receipt button and rather than um, having the ability to completely clear the contents of the email, which made no sense given that you could just press the X on the top, we now have an option that allows you to set the type. Now there were two types, there's next mail and non-next mail. If you were communicating with a site that say used Sun workstations, you'd use non-next mail because next mail itself is a custom rich text format that not many mail clients at the time understood. In fact, from my understanding, only next mail understood. Uh, it was a big pain in the backside to convert next mail into non-next mail. Um, my email, HTML 
Yahoo!, email, all that jazz that we now take for granted didn't exist back then. That wasn't created until uh, 1996, 1997-ish, I think. Um, so we only had Nextmail and ASCII text. And the rest of the world used ASCII text, and sites that used Next hardware used Nextmail. If you wanted to create a non-Next email and you tried to, I uh, let's say, um, you tried to drag this file into it here, it wouldn't let you. And if you tried to do anything that required next mail, you would see a red triangle, or in this case a slightly grey triangle, underneath the post box and deliver. And this tells you, hey, look, what you are about to send requires that the recipient have a next computer with next mail. Please be careful. So the reply all and reply button worked exactly the same. The receipt button, on the other hand, if I just send myself a test message with the receipt button enabled and I deliver that, let's wait a few seconds for the system to deliver it, and then I go to Utilities, New Mail. It's given me the ping, but there's nothing showing up. There we are. So here we have a new mail, uh, unread, signified by the little circle there. Contains attachment, as signified by the little triangle there. If I click on it, there's the attachment. I can double click on it. The attachment opens. I can drag the attachment out of mail, etc, etc, etc. And if I um, then click on new mail again, here we have a read receipt. And that basically says that I've read the mail that I sent to myself. Um, that sounds particularly bad, but hey, it's just a demo. This isn't really a feature that's, that's around in many mail clients today because it is ripe for abuse. I could send an email off, and I have done this. I have sent an email to Steve Jobs asking him if he had kindly released the source code to Next Step 3, and I got a response back saying no. I also got a read receipt back, and this was in 1998, when he was iCEO of Apple, and Apple were in the process of announcing the MacBook and OS X, and the read receipt indicated to me that he was using NextMail on Next Step 3.3 on a Next Cube, and I was quite amazed at this. It's also worth mentioning that, that Steve actually used Concurrence on a Next Step box to do all his Keynote presentations right up to the time when Keynotes was released for OS X. But that's, that's an anecdote that doesn't really have any particular meaning for this video because I don't have Concurrence on here, so I can't show you what I mean. So anyway, that's email. Um, this also gives me the perfect opportunity to demonstrate the uh, lip service functionality, which unfortunately I wasn't able to demonstrate up until now. So if I have a look at this email from Steve, and I scroll down, all the way down, and I double click on this pair of lips here, I think I will let Steve do the talking. Hi, this is Steve Jobs. I want to welcome you to the next world. We think you're going to love this computer. It's got the most advanced applications of any computer shipping today, and it's the first computer designed from scratch to be an interpersonal computer, to extend personal computing into the realm of improving group productivity and collaboration, which we think is going to be the most exciting thing happening in desktop computing in the first half of the 90s. So welcome to the next world, and let us know what you think of your new computer. I think my new computer is awesome. So that's lip service. Again, if you wanted to record something, you'd press the lips in the send window, you'd press record, you'd talk, and you'd click stop, and when you were done, you'd click on insert and then send. So that's email. Now, Webster's hasn't really changed. Librarian has. So it is worth looking at librarian. Um, compared to the previous release, um, the Bookshelves are now back at the top of the window. Uh, it's using the same technology as the shelf in the file viewer, but it works pretty much the same. So, for example, I can list all the titles, but they're not right now files. Well, there's a reason for that, and I'm going to get into that next. So, if I go and search for um, NX Zone Malloc, and if I single click on it, nothing will happen, but if I double click on it, it will load in its own viewer. It will not load right now, it will not load edit, it will load in its own viewer. And the benefits of this are, 
when you opened it in right now, it would go to the first occurrence of the word, and then you had to go to edit and find or what have you, and, and you know, try and find a real occurrence that you needed if you were looking something up. With this one, you just continue to mash the find button until you get to where you need to be, in which case this is the second result. Here you go. This is the manual page for the memory allocation functions that use next steps zones. So that's librarian. The next thing worth noting is that right now is now a demo. This is when they finally got round to unbundling it to some other company because everyone complained that Next had the advantage. So this is provided in demo mode which only lets you read files, which makes sense because Next Step 1, virtually all the documentation was provided in right now. The, the, word processor of choice was right now, so the sites upgrading to Next Step 2 suddenly found that right now was owned by some other company, um, which causes them a problem because all their existing documents are right now. Well, at least you have a demo that allows you to open the files in right now, then you can copy paste them into edit, because by this time, edit has kind of got the similar functionality to right now anyway, so no loss there. Or you could import the file into WriteUp or, or FrameMaker or, or whatever you want to import it into. Let's see what else we have. Well, under the applications, we have another big change, which is Preview, which is no longer a demonstration application. This is now as it was uh, from Next Step 2 up to Rhapsody, up to OS 10. It's even in Mac OS Sierra. This is the tool that lets you preview images, lets you preview uh, postscript files, etc. It doesn't let you preview all images, only TIFF images, um, but there were a third-party tool that we will be looking at in a future video that let you preview virtually any other image file format that you can think of. Next big difference is that Shell has been merged with Terminal and has now got fairly good VT100 compliance. This claims to be a VT102. So Vi works perfectly, Emacs works perfectly, you don't have to worry about which one to open, which one's got the terminal support, which one hasn't, what terminal support it has, what terminal support is missing, it just works. We have another application which is new, which is called Installer. And Installer basically lets you take a package off, um, say, a CD-ROM and automatically install it. It will put all the components in the right place. It will make sure the components have the right file systems and permissions and ownership. It will make sure that everything's installed where it needs to be. And it will, it will write a receipt that then allows you to uninstall that package at a later date. This is better than going into the apps directory and, uh, let's say, dragging this into the recycle bin because you don't know what else has been installed besides the application. There could be libraries, there could be system binaries, there could be configuration files, there could be header files, there could be frameworks, etc. So the uninstaller allowed you to, to cleanly uninstall. As an example, if I open up um, the open menu, uh, sorry, the open dialog, um, this is going to be under next library packages, and if I go to third party and then improv, this tells me that Improv is installed, and I could use the Delete button to completely remove the package, and I can use the List button to show what was installed by the package. If I go to Log View, here we have all the files that have been installed by the Improv package. Next we have the fax reader. If you had a fax modem in attached to your machine, you could basically make the Next receive incoming faxes. It could then display the faxes save them to the hard disk as tagged image format, um, which could then be put into document storage or emailed or what have you. So I don't think there's anything else application-wise to cover. So let's see if there are any demos worth exploring. Well, we have here some new applications to help development um, that let you inspect applications while they are running, such as the resources they use, the memory they use, and the, the actual control of the process itself. Uh, Demo-wise, pretty much the same demos. There's no Mathematica, there's no FrameMaker. There is Next TV, which is a Next Dimension demonstration. Let's see what it does. Well, I don't have any um, S video to put on this, uh, so unfortunately, um, I don't think there is going to be anything I can do with this.
nope, there's nothing I'm going to be able to do with this. But basically, the next dimension had an S-Video input. Um, so if you wired up the S-Video input on this, um, you would then see whatever was being broadcast through S-Video, and you could use this to, I don't know, watch TV if you wanted to. Which is why it's called Next TV. So what else do we have on here? Well, not really that much. We still have Stealth, which is awesome. And Stealth has got a colour icon. Does this mean Stealth is in colour? Yes! Stealth is in colour! Oh, the excitement. Oh, oh yes. So let's see if I can set the, um, let's see, 118.6. Oh, oh, and it works. It's for information Delta, 1500 Greenwich weather. Better than 5005. Temperature 65.55. Wind 360 at 10. Altimeter 2978. ILS runway 18 in use. Landing runway 18. Departing runway 36. Contact tower on 119.6. Advise control on initial contact US Delta. Thank you. Let's see, where's my communications? Uh, here's my communications. Yeah, yeah, I'm just gonna go for it, dude. I'm not even gonna bother waiting for you to say okay. I'm just gonna go for it. Uh, let's put my flaps to 10. Whoa! Okay, flaps uh, to zero. Let's climb for a bit. We have colour. I am so glad I got this working on the next dimension. I didn't know that Stealth had a colour version. Right, let's, let's lower the RPM and settle in for a nice cruise. And it has a rudder! Oh, awesome. This just gets better and better. It would be better if they ported this to Intel. But this is fun. Oh, my gear's still down. Let's see what else they have. Let's 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 So we have we have water, I think that's water. We have ground, which is all the same colour. We have rocks that are brown. And we have whatever that is that's floating there in the air. What is that? Can I fly through it? Will it make the plane explode? Is it a next cube? Can next cubes fly? Okay, so I guess they turned collision detection off because too many people did what I did and flew into it. Oh, well. Let's just go and look at the lovely ground here. I can't see it getting any closer, but it is. Very close. Very, very, very close. So close I could touch it any second now. In fact, now. Oh, they got rid of the crash noise. Oh, well, okay. So that's stealth in color. Awesome. Okay, so that's pretty much it for the demos. Now let's have a look at some of the administration applications. Now, uh, build disk has been available since 0.8. I can't really show you it because I don't have a second hard disk with which to build. Um, there's no point in, in trying to use it without one. Build DOS, again, I don't have any floppy disks attached to this particular emulator, so there's no point showing that. 
Install tablet lets you install device drivers for various manufacturers of tablets. Mail manager has gone through some changes. Not only does it let you manage the mail pictures and set up a mail server, but it lets you delete a mail server if you change your mind. Previously, you had to go in and, and restore the send mail configuration by hand, etc. NetInfo Manager, I don't think has had any changes. Let's have a look. I think maybe one, actually. Uh, let's double click on demo. Yes, they've made the directory browser a bit easier to use compared to 1.0. But other than that, it's fairly much the same. You can open arbitrary domains, including the parent domain. You can edit stuff and you can save stuff. Net Manager has changed a little bit. Nope, I keep on mistyping. There we are. So the local network preferences have gone through a reorganization and they've renamed Configuration Server to NetInfo and Configuration Server just to make it clearer that this will enable NetInfo. Um, this also supports network time so you can configure a NetInfo server as a time server. The hosts have changed, now you can open a host using the domain browser. But pretty much the same thing, you can configure a host name, its IP address, MAC address, and boot P information uh, for diskless or fin clients. Printer tester, again, there's no point showing that because I don't have a printer. Um, but all it does is let you generate print test pages. User Manager, I think, has had some changes. Ah, uh, yes, it has. Rather than coming up um, with the new user panel straight away, and now you have to use the menu to select one. You can then select between network and local. The difference is network will let you create a user on a NetInfo master, and local will create one in the local NetInfo database. The good thing about this is now that an administrator can use his or her own next workstation without going and logging into the NetInfo master to add a user. So again, you have a window here with what looks like the next step login panel. If you click on long form, it will let you edit the user information. Rather than letting you select another user to edit, this lets you select the group because now you don't need to select the user from the list. You can use open user. You can also open and edit user groups. And pretty much the same thing. You can edit groups locally or you can edit groups on the domain. So that's the user manager. Now I have some applications here that I installed previously for Next Step 2.2. Although to be fair, I think one of them, at least one of them, is for Next Step 3.0, which is Illustrator, but I'm going to show them anyway. So Illustrator can handle color as well as grayscale. And this is probably one of, one of the killer applications available for Next at the time. I'm going to show off my wonderful drawing skills here. Let's create a shaded bezier curve, I think this is. Nope, let's not. Let's create just some random curves because my art skills are limited to making stuff that that looks like that. Um, I don't know what that's meant to be and it's not going to win any awards so I'm just going to pretend it didn't happen and so are you. So next we have Adobe Separator. Um, now I think Adobe provided this as a color separation process. Uh, when you launch this, this asks for a PPD, a Postscript Printer Definition and an image and I suspect that what it does is um, in order to support uh, professional printers, this color separates it out into cyan, magenta, yellow, and black so that a color image can be composited in a professional printer. Um, I've never used this. I don't have a printer attached to the machine, so I'm just guessing. If I'm right, if I'm wrong, let me know. If you know what separator does or what it did, feel free to let me know. And finally, we have touch type, which I believe is a font editor. And 
Next application is one which was, again, a killer application for the Next. Now, unfortunately, this is only available for um, M68K machines. The same thing with Illustrator. Um, to my knowledge, there was never a Next Step Intel port of Illustrator, and there certainly wasn't a Next Step Intel port of Improv. And Improv is kind of like a spreadsheet, but more like a data modeling tool. So I'll show you what I mean by that. If I, if I open one of the examples, if I go over here and then local apps, improv, models, let's have a look at market share. Open copy. So what we have here is something that looks like a spreadsheet, but it's not. So right now we are looking at all regions for year. So we can see here that Galaxy, Vending, Grocery, Supermarket, all channels, and we can see the percentages of um, sh market share um, over each year. So if I didn't want that, if I wanted to say, have a look at the product over year, I could remove region, put that down by there, take product, put product up by here. Um, let's have a look, um, all products. So we can see here that um, the market share for all products from Grocery for 1988 was 6.87. If I want to have a look at it just for, the, let's say, snack, uh, Snackers, then we can see here that it's 1.72. Well, okay, let's have a look at it for product for region. Okay, so we can see here that Snackers in 1988, in the West, it had 5.72% market share, etc., etc. So this is pretty much a data modeling tool, as well as looking like a spreadsheet. So that's Improv. Um, the only other application to show is, um, is Interface Builder, but there are not really many cosmetic changes. Uh, between Interface Builder on Next Step 2 and Interface Builder on Next Step 1. We have to wait until Next Step 3 before the next big revision in Interface Builder and the way in which we manage projects on the next machines. And I will be demonstrating that in future videos. Um, so again, this is pretty much it for the Next Step 2.0 system. We have glorious colour, we have multiple monitor support, and that's pretty much it. So I hope you've enjoyed this video, as usual if you have any comments or suggestions feel free to leave them in the box below. Thank you for watching and see you next time!